my pleasure to introduce Bernd Dushfold, uh, Professor of Astronautical Engineering at uh, the University of Applied Sciences in Aachen. And Bernd's going to talk to us about the Ice Bowl project. Yes, thank you for your introduction. Yeah, so we have seen that there is life in the ice and there are also interesting sub-glacial aquatic environments that are worth of investigation and therefore we have developed a subsurface ice probe uh, called ice mole that, it's, uh, yeah, that melts um, through the ice. Um, if we think about drilling in, um, on Earth and on other planets, so there are two typical methods. One is ice core drilling, which is typically used on the Earth, and it has, especially for planetary applications, that it has a lot of disadvantages. It's not clean, you need drilling fluids to keep the borehole open that are quite dirty, and you need a lot of effort, a big team on the surface, which is not imaginable for planetary missions. Therefore, um, melting probes were invented already in the 60s, um, originally for Earth, then also for space applications, what you can see here is a melting probe that was developed by DLR, but um, melting probes also have de been developed by JPL. This was called the Cryobot. And um, at FA Aachen, or our motto is think differently <laughs> um, and make it happen. And so we thought about a very new concept and came along with the eye mole, uh, ice mole. Um, and the concept, in <laughs> principle, it's very simple. So like a mole on the Earth, we should have a device that is able to dig through the ice, not just to go vertically down like drills and like uh, melting probes, but that should be able to move around obstacles in the ice to find interesting regions in the ice. And in reality, of course, our ice mole looks not that cute, but it's almost as ugly as other space hardware. <laughs> it just looks like a steel pencil, a quite long one, so it's two meters now. Uh, here you can see it in its deployment rack before it is injected into the Mortarach Glacier in Switzerland. And yeah, as I said, like a mole, it's able, yeah, I'm not sure wh whether to call it melting or mel it's essentially it's melting in combination with screwing, not drilling. And so just let's say dig through the ice. So it can dig through the ice horizontally and even vertically upwards, which allows the recovery of the probe after, um, after the melting. So this forward motion, this sticking, um, is done with an eye screw at the tip. So this eye screw is really the game changer with respect to conventional melting probes because it generates a driving force that presses the melting head firmly against the ice. And so you have a very good heat transfer at the tip of the ice. And you can use this um, eye screw also to ingest some samples into the ice mold that you can investigate within the probe in situ. If you isolate the, the screw thermally from the melting head, you can ingest um, unmelted ice into the probe where you can investigate it. Or you can also use, um, as we have done it now in our last project in Antarctica, a proboscis that um, is extended and that can sample liquids below the ice. So. Yeah, at the tip you have a uh, quite high power, so in total it's um, almost three kilowatts of power that we have. And you have a variety of instrumentation options that you can put behind this melting head. So now how does the maneuverability in ice work? So this works by differential heating. So uh, we have here in the middle the ice crew, and now if you heat this side of the, of the melting head more than the left side, then more ice will be melted away on this side and the ice will remain here on the left side and the screw does not, change, uh, does not generate only a force but also a torque around this remaining ice and so it would force the ice mold into a curve to the right. Uh, in, yeah, to the right in this case and you can support this by side wall heaters that support the turning of this two meter long uh, probe. The power supply 
is, at least on Earth, the simplest version is to have a generator on the surface and um, the power transmission is via a cable and you, you can use the same cable or a separate cable then also for um, communication with the ice mole. Um, this power a generator also if you would use it in an archetype can also have an antenna and can transmit your data right into the laboratory. So it should work uh, in the future it should work at least on earth autonomously. Um, our first field tests with this technology were done in Switzerland on the Modraj glacier and here already with the first test this was in 2010 we have I think we have made the first drilling upwards um, with a 45 angle. We have drilled about 5 meters horizontally. We have shown that the probe can, with the ice screw, it can penetrate dirt layers. So of about 2 to 3 centimeters, it should not become too thick. But thin dirt layers can be penetrated and that we can also drive a curve. But the radius of curvature was uh, much higher than for a real mole, so 10 meters, but I think 10 meters in the ice is still okay. We also penetrated a crevasse in Iceland, we made this test, a crevasse that was found by our super cheap that found this crevasse and broke down during finding it. And <laughs> so we used it to, to show that we can penetrate a crevasse with potentially a, a liquid filled crevasse without the whole ice mole head going into the crevasse so that we can stop it and only the screw should penetrate the wall of the crevasse. So in uh, summarizing this, we have some advantages with respect to conventional drills and with, with respect to melting probes. So the biggest advantage, of course, is I think is the controllability. We have obstacle avoidance and uh, we can also make um, in situ profile measurements. So with a, a drill and a melting probe, if you have an interesting layer, they can only pierce this layer or penetrate it at a certain point. And with the ice mob, we, we could follow an interesting layer um, that is not possible with drills and melting probes. We can also penetrate dirt layers. This can also be done by drills, but not by melting probes. And we can recover the probe. Um, um, melting probes are difficult to recover because if the ice, if the channel freezes behind the probe, you cannot recover it. Whereas with the ice mold, you can uh, drive upwards or dig upwards again. Then um, the, the other three problems are just relevant for drills. You have contamination, um, you can't operate them autonomously, you need a team on the surface and therefore they are not feasible for, at least in my opinion, they are not feasible for space applications and also hot water drills are not feasible for um, space applications. Melting probes won't, will do this but they have the other advantages, uh, disadvantages. So, um, we heard a lot about the astrobiological targets of high priority. Um, certainly it's Mars, Europa and Enceladus, but on Mars it might be useful for a first application of the ice mold to penetrate it or to drill into the polar caps of Mars, but um, the chances for life are not that high because there is probably no liquid water, only ice. In Europa we have the problem that the ice is very deep, 5 to 20 kilometers or even larger, and hidden under the ice. So I like the movie by, by Bill Stone who, who penetrates the ice with 10 meters per second or something like that. You see just the, the probe falling through the ice. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we make one meter per hour, <laughs> or I, I would prefer to say a thousand millimeters per hour. That sounds cooler. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Enceladus maybe is the, the best... Um, the best target to find life within the next 50 years or so because there is a liquid water at a depth of probably several hundred meters. But we have to go there. Um, Enceladus is a quite small moon if you compare it with um, Great Britain. You know that there, we also saw something about the tiger stripes, I will not repeat this. Um, but this would be an interesting area to uh, have a further investigation, not just a fly through, but a more e detailed in situ analysis of the material there. Um, those are the plumes by Cassini. Yeah, another, bill, uh, another image about the, the current model, how those plumes uh, can happen. I, um, there are also more specialists on this, but there are the plumes. They uh, penetrate the ice and they come to the surface and are ejected into space. And it would be interesting to land there. 
So I'm really thankful to NASA who can afford of paying uh, artists for making such nice pictures and the American taxpayers who, who pay for that. That's not possible in Europe. <laughs> we do not have such nice pictures. Um, yeah, it's uh, how an artist imagines how it would look like if you land there. And you can see it's a very tough, t a very rough terrain. It's hard to land. And in reality, if you look to a real image, then it's even rougher. So if you have, you have the, um, the fractures in the eyes here, so where would you land um, safely? Probably not very close to such a crevasse, but a little bit farther away, maybe on such a plateau. It would be already difficult. And then if you are on such a plateau, it would be, uh, it's an, an idea to melt yourself through the ice and then to penetrate such a crevasse at a depth of uh, several hundred meters where you still find liquid uh, liquids. And you already saw this, this image. So um, this is a, mission scenario and the mission objective would be to drill or to send the ice mold to the plume where it is the liquid to get a sample but this is not trivial so you have probably um, empty cracks so not uh, water filled cracks at the surface you have obstacles in the ice and so you have to be able to navigate the probe through the ice and this was the um, the objective of the, the project that we had so um, from the space agency, they established a, a quite large project which they called Enceladus Explorer. And um, this was um, funded by the navigation department of the German Space Agency. So we had to put some navigation on board of the ice mole. At FA Aachen, I was the PI for the team. Uh, for the whole team and um, we built the, the melting probe, the ice mole, and the, our other partners, they built the navigation technology. And the, the goal of our project was the development of an autonomous steerable subsurface ice probe to demonstrate autonomous navigation in deep ice. On Earth, not yet in space. And our tests, um, then we thought what would be the best um, test location probably Antarctica. And uh, yeah, first I want to show you something about the, the um, navigation payload or the navigation systems we had on board. We had inertial navigation on board to uh, measure the attitude. So and if you measure the attitude and you know your velocity, then you can integrate um, those equations of motion forward and then you know where you are in the ice and in which orientation. We had ultrasound sensors in the head to detect the crevasse and to detect obstacles in the ice. Acoustic pingers on the surface that um, um, can measure their distance and by trilateration you can measure the position of the ice mold in the ice independently from the inertial measurement unit. And afterwards, we had then some intelligent multi-sensor fusion to generate a scenario uh, for the operator. Because if you look to the raw data as an operator, you cannot see anything. You need some interface, some, some uh, graphical interface to, um, to show where you are. Okay, and then we wanted to have some trajectory optimization with respect to risk, resources, and time. Um, already before this project was started, I met um, Slavik Tulacek, who is a glaciologist at uh, University of California in Santa Cruz. And he said, hey Bernd, uh, can you build such an ice mole for me? We have an interesting um, proposal. It's called Mitch Mini Valley Invasive Direct Glacial Exploration. And we want to go to Blood Falls in Antarctica. And there's a sub glacial um, reservoir of water or brine. And we want to have a clean sample. Um, the other um, collaborators of him were was Chirmi Cookie, who will be on the on Skype uh, after my talk, and she was the PI for the Mitch project, and yeah, so we teamed up, and together we got our proposals funded. So it was really helpful for the U.S. team to have a German proposal and for the German team to have a, a U.S. proposal uh, with almost the same goals. So um, their goal was to get a clean sample from Blood Falls. Blood Falls is in, uh, in the dry valleys in Antarctica. There is the Taylor Glacier. And below, beneath the Taylor Glacier, there is a subglacial brine reservoir um, where that is very rich in, in iron and in sulfur, but there is no oxygen in it. And from time to time, this reservoir releases 
uh, the brine through a fissure or through a crack in the ice and this is called blood faults. If it comes out the iron immediately oxidizes and this gives this red color here. Um, and there is um, a lot of life. Chilmi Cookie already collected brine and studied the brine there and she found a lot of cells that live in this brine. But what she wanted to have is a clean sample of this brine, not a surface sample but a, surf a sample from deep inside the glacier. And if you look to this image, there was a, this is the crevasse through which the brine is released and it looks almost like Enceladus. So we can test our operational scenario by landing somewhere there and then drilling our way through the glacier and get some liquid from the crevasse as it is expected for Enceladus. So the objective of the Mitch proposal was a clean sample return of subglacial water from a crevasse for life detection and analysis and those two objectives worked really in harmony in, in this combined project which was really uh, fortunate. So the problem if you go to um, Taylor Glacier in Antarctica is that it is a so-called um, ASPA, an Antarctic Specially Protected Area. So you have almost the same regulations that are valid for planetary protection. So the National Research Council, they have a code of conduct and they did a re recommendation and said that said, the number of microbial cells contained in or on the volume of any material or instrument added to or placed in these environments should not exceed the minimum concentration of microbes in the basal glacial ice being passed through. And this is the most, the, the cleanest um, ice on the earth. Uh, there are 2,000, only 2,000 cells per milliliter, which is quite low for terrestrial standards. And so we fortunately we had the money also to care a little about uh, care also a little about, bit about the planetary protection and the decontamination of the probe. So we uh, decontaminated according to the ECSS standards. That's the European Committee for Space Standardization, and this is the standard for planetary protection. We did a cleaning of the probe of the instruments with UV radiation with H2O2 uh, and so on, and uh, monitored everything and reported everything to um, NSF. So this is the, um, the probe, how it looks now, the, the latest version that we also used in Antarctica. It has now a length of two meters. The first uh, prototype has only one meter, so it grew because of uh, the many subsystems that we had to accommodate. Uh, you can still carry it with two people, about 60 kilograms, and we have a clean sampling system on board. Um, the power is quite large now that we, we need or that we can use and even with this power the welding velocity is only a thousand millimeters per hour and the curve radius is still um, 10 to 15 meters thanks to the side wall heaters that we have um, included. So this image shows the, 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 all the subsystems we have here. Um, the the melting head with a, with a phased arrays. Um, we have an acoustic subsystem for measuring the sounds from the pingers that are on the surface. Uh, the dead reckoning box has an inertial measurement unit uh, that measures the orientation in space. Uh, power supply sample container here. We had two sample bags where we could um, uh, pump ultra clean brine into the sample bags. We could more uh, pump up through the melt water uh, um, a tubing to the surface and yeah that's more or less the, the all the navigation systems and essentially I, I'm, I'm was already I think uh, William asked me yesterday so what do you want to bring down with this ice mold and I said um, it's like if you if you ask a, a truck uh, company what do you want to transport with your trucks um, so that's not really our problem so we are engineers not scientists but if we find or if there is a scientist who is interested in studying the ice while going down in Antarctica or in a glacier, um, you can put any instrument into the ice mold as long as it um, is compatible with those um, not very demanding mechanical, electrical and, and data standards. So this is more or less state of the art and you should be able to um, convert 
all data and things like that into the into this format. So we tested it. So for uh, as I said, we had to be very clean on. Uh, the Taylor Glacier on blood falls and if you say, if you claim you are very clean, nobody will believe you. You have to prove it. And for proving this we had one year before in 2013 we made a first test also in the dry valleys but on the Canada Glacier which is not an ASPA and the, the protection requirements are not that tough. So we tested the, the ice mole on this glacier and yeah, here you can see how it enters the ice. I, I will show you a small movie afterwards. And this is what I, what I mean with minimally invasive. So this is everything that we have left. Three holes, small holes in the glacier. So I if you are on a walk and anywhere on the world you find quadratic holes, that's us. <laughs> um, here I have an small movie, time-lapse movie, how the ice mall is injected into the ice. And another movie from... So this is how it looks like. Currently we have a, a, a package for tubing and for electrical uh, things. Uh, which was uh, of course not be feasible on Europa or Enceladus. So this was our operational scenario and the challenge for 2014 for last year. So we wanted to have the ice mole somewhere here close to the crevasse and then we wanted to melt to the crevasse and we thought okay there is this crevasse filled with brine and we just penetrate the crevasse with the um, ice crew and with the proboscis and then we sample um, w brine, pump it to the surface, at the surface it is checked whether it's clean and when it's clean uh, we fill two sample bags and um, those can be brought back to the surface. However, in 2013 when we were at Canada Glacier we already had a small excursion to the Taylor Glacier and we saw that this crevasse was closed. You could not see where this crevasse is and um, the, the search for this crevasse would really have been the, the search for the needle in a haystack. But fortunately our American colleague Erin Pettit in the year in the year 2013 she also made a radar um, scanning of the glacier and she could she said, okay, here the probability is the highest. And we took the location that she has proposed. So this was now the drilling in November last year. Um, where we established a, a camp on the surface. So this is the target crevasse. Um, you can see it's not really there, but um, the, the data showed that the liquid water, the brine, must be somewhere below this red line. So we set out our pingers. We had this uh, clean tent for the launch of the, of the ice mole. Uh, everything had to be sterilized in there and we had another ops tent for the dirty engineers and everybody who is not that clean. Um, so we released the ice mole here, you can see it in a sterile packing from the clean tent and then it melted into the ice. Uh, this is an operator how it he looks like after four weeks of uh, operations on the glacier. And yeah, we really found the brine. The sampling into the um, internal sample containers did not work, but we were able to pump about 400 pints of brine to the surface. So this is not a, a pea bottle, this is really the brine. It looks a little bit yellowish, probably because of the sulfur. And yeah, we encountered it after 18 meters of drilling. And Jill was very happy that she had her uncontaminated brine for the first time. Um, at the same time for the Enceladus Explorer we also, or a colleague of mine, made a mission concept with an orbiter, with a lander, um, what would be required and he published that, if you want to read that, there's a paper in Acta Astronautica about the whole mission concept. But you can see here that the, so he assumed or he said probably we would need a nuclear power source. Um, I'm not sure about that. Maybe you can also do it with an RTG, but the problem is with an RTG that maybe you cannot stop the probe because you cannot switch off an RTG. The question is, I have not answered this so far, this would be a good 
problem for a future master thesis, um, whether you can dissipate the energy of the RTG uh, in a way into the ice that the probe will stop for the next 100 or 200 years. Um, there's no stable orbit. If you have an orbiter around Enceladus, it was one of the most chaotic environments in the solar system because the sphere of influence of Enceladus is very small. It has only uh, a size of, I think, a, an altitude of 200 meters. And if you fly higher than 200 meters, you're already ripped away out of the orbit by, Chubi, uh, by Saturn. And um, it tends to increase the in eccentricity of the orbit. And if you fly on a very low orbit and the eccentricity is slightly increased, you already hit the surface. So flying around Enceladus with an orbiter is really not simple. And this will be a big challenge for a future mission. Yeah, so um, those are, this is where we want to go. We want, uh, currently we have achieved already so, many or some terrestrial mission scenarios. There are sure, surely more mission scenarios where, where we could test the technology, but in the end we want to go into space. So, and the first goal may, may be the polar caps of Mars that we can drill, and then in 20, 30 years, uh, maybe Europa or Enceladus, but if, we, if you can count, so the, the, the launch of, um, of the choose mission will be in 2020, the arrival will be in 2030. If, they, if everybody says, okay, we need a lander, it's so interesting, we, did, we need a lander on Europa. This decision is done in 2030, it will be built for 10 years, so it will be finished in 2040, and it will land on Europa or Enceladus maybe in 2046 or 2047. There's no way to be there earlier, and fortunately there are terrestrial mission scenarios that can keep you motivated for your work, because I would not be very motivated to work for a mission that happens um, in 50 years or so. Yeah, so we have now to take the next step and uh, in the direction of making uh, this uh, uh, available or, or compatible with the current conditions uh, encountered in space. And our next project for the next three years is called NX Next for Environmental Experimental Testing. And we want, what we want to do is we want to shrink the ice mall, we want to make it smaller, only 8 times 8 times 50 centimeters with only 1 kilowatt and less than 5 kilograms. And then we will test the ice mall in our vacuum chamber, we will refurbish the vacuum chamber so that we can put in um, ice under less than about six millibars, which is the sublimation uh, pressure for, for water, and um, with n liquid nitrogen cooling so that we <coughs> achieve temperatures below minus 180 degrees Celsius, which is then quite close to the conditions that we find on the icy moons. And then we want to show in the vacuum chamber that this concept with the ice crew still works under simulated um, Europa, Enceladus, and Mars conditions. Yes, so thank you for your attention. This finishes my talk. Okay, has anyone got any questions on the ice mall? You know, last time I was actually giving me my question, what do you do about sublimation? Because the volume change could potentially be huge and it might just explosively Back out again. Do, you, do you channel the gas around or is that engineering? Hello, to, typically the, the, the water or the gas challenges channels itself, so you create channels in the ice where, where the water escapes. But I think for a real mission, the, there would be a better strategy. So you would have sublimation first, but then you can prevent sublimation just by covering the channel so that you prevent the water or the, 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 um, the vapor to. to um, yeah, to, to leave the channel. And so you need just a, a small pressure of about 10 millibars and then you will get rid of the sublimation and that would make it much easier. <laughs>